Hello, everyone. I'm Lauren Singleton, Dean of the Lubin School of Business. I'd like to welcome you to the Dean's Roundtable. I'm pleased today to welcome Richard Venegas, uh, who is the founder and managing director of Snap Global Solutions to the Dean's Roundtable. After graduating from PACE, Mr. Venegas had a career as a financial analyst for Citibank and Capital Bank before transitioning to Disney Consumer Products as its manager of new business development. He then left Disney to start his own company, Snap Global Solutions, in 1999. From Disney to DreamWorks, Hasbro to Mattel, Snap helps bring to market licensed products smoothly and quickly through its turnkey design, sourcing, and manufacturing services. Snap creates fun, quality, and competitively priced products for mass market, specialty, private label, international, and theme park clientele. Some of his partnerships include Dr. Seuss, Shrek, SpongeBob SquarePants, Hello Kitty, and Star Wars. In 2014, he launched Snap Toys brand to reinvent and reimagine the world of classic play. With an exclusive focus on creating fun character and story-based activity feature plush, Snap Toys has had some great results with a growing retail presence, presence throughout the globe. Ricardo received his BBA in economics from the Lubin School of Business in New York City in 1988. He later went on to Florida International University to receive his MBA in management information systems. Please welcome Ricardo Venegas to the Dean's Roundtable. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Dean Singleton. Hi, everyone. How are you? How's New York doing today? Great. I'm uh, coming to you from South Florida. Uh, and another beautiful day down here. And uh, so uh, pretty soon, I'm sure I'll see you down here. Seems like all of New York is starting to move down here. So uh, if you're ever down here, let me know. But uh, seriously speaking, uh, I'm very happy to be here and hopefully talk a little bit about my story. Uh, what uh, what transpired since my years at Pace University, uh, the experiences that I went through um, that uh, culminated in my becoming an entrepreneur, uh, and which uh, led me to, to start my company, um, which we've been in business since uh, 1999, um, uh, designing, manufacturing uh, toys. Uh, someone has to help Santa uh, and uh, bring joy uh, to many kids and parents around the world. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, toys uh, is, is not all kids, kids work. It's, uh, it's one of the most heavily regulated products in the world. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's, it's given me the opportunity to learn so many more things uh, about manufacturing, about design, about marketing, and about uh, leadership. So uh, about myself, uh, as Dean Singleton was saying, yeah, I graduated back in 1999. Um, and uh, I, I did everything that, that could lead me to a, a degree in toy, I mean, business in toys. I have an economics degree and then I have a master's in information system. So it just goes to show you that uh, knowledge, no matter where you pick it up, is really applicable to all kinds of uh, careers. Uh, for me, economics was really great because it uh, allowed me to, to really study people. It's a social science. I really wanted to know what makes uh, people tick. Um, and I also wanted to be uh, close to the financial district because at that time, Pace University was obviously situated very close to uh, the world of finance. Um, and, and while being at Pace, uh, I got to um, be involved uh, in one of the programs that I, that I think was very uh, influential called the Leadership Development Program. I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but uh, it was something very special to me. The moderator, uh, her name was Grace Lamacchia Paris, and she... Uh, took a liking to me and gave me a chance to join this very, very exciting group. Uh, taught me a lot about uh, to believe in yourself, really. I think that's what she helped me believe that I could accomplish many things. Uh, and from there, um, it, it led to uh, a career in some uh, finance companies. Um, while at Pace, I was also a, a part of the WPUB radio station. I don't know if any of you listen to WPUB um, still, but... Uh, it actually, uh, at WPUB, I was the uh, mobile uh, director. That means uh, WP had a crew that would go to parties uh, and we would be the DJs and whatnot for the parties. And, and believe it or not, it was one of my first entrepreneurial experiences because they used to book one party a year and we got to be booked like 10 times a year. I brought in a great crew. We ended up having competitions with the uh, uh, upstate uh, campuses at PUB. Uh, 
I mean, uh, uh, it, it just goes to show you that anything that you do with passion, even being a little, you know, radio station crew, uh, but if you work with people, uh, you can sell a great idea. Uh, and, and that WP, PUB had these events that were huge, uh, uh, let me tell you. So uh, if I'm plugging WPUB, I, I believe it was a great time. It's, it's something I really enjoyed about being at, at Pace. So Snack Global Solutions, what is Snack Global Solutions? Uh, as the Dean said, basically we, we're what we call a turnkey design and manufacturing company. And so that means people come to me, uh, these Fortune 500 companies uh, uh, like Mattel, Hasbro, the Walt Disney Company, uh, DreamWorks, Marvel Studios, Lucasfilm, just to, just to name drop a couple of people out there. Um, well, these guys have fun IP, intellectual property. And you know they come up with these characters and stuff. And, and uh, this guy might be someone that, that you may have come across in, in, in the last couple of years. Uh, well, he was a star of his own TV show. And basically in working with these companies, uh, we get this behind the scenes look at what's happening in the world of entertainment. Uh, and we're challenged by these companies to bring to life these characters from a two dimensional to a three dimensional, something that they can therefore take to their consumer products divisions and market it and sell it to you. Uh, as, as a toy or as some other three-dimensional uh, product. At least that's, that's what we do. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. And it sure beats selling snow, uh, soap, I say all the time, because, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. We get to, I get to see what's at the pulse, what's driving kids nowadays, what they're interested in. Um, and it also, it's, 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 a, it's in a challenge for our team because it's a constantly rotating uh, a book of new ideas. And, and what worked at the last movie or in the last television show or in the last animated movie doesn't necessarily gonna mean why? Because you, the audience are changing as fast as, as, as anything else. Kids are the most fickle uh, audience out there in the world. And, and uh, you know, from the spinners that became uh, you know, a success to, you know, to the, to, when, in our day, the pet rock was a big thing. I'm sure Dean Singleton is laughing right there. He remembers the pet rock, things like that. Um, it really means, um, and, 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 and typical me, I'll bring it all into a circle, uh, paying attention to what happens around you, listening, uh, reading, uh, really comes to help. Some of my ideas that have come from, from projects have come from visiting museums. Uh, from going to uh, uh, different places outside of my boundaries of normal places. And later on, I'll come back to my teams uh, uh, and challenge them and say, look, I came across this idea. Can we apply it to this, this, and this? So it's, it's, it's what it, you know, learning doesn't stop the moment you put the books down. Learning is an ongoing 24 seven thing. And, and I think that one of the takeaways that I have for you today about being an entrepreneur is that the learning never stops, the listening never stops, uh, and the challenging yourself to be better never stops. So, uh, so with that, um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what Pace did for me. So when I was at Pace, I was studying economics, and, and they put me to work at uh, uh, Drexel in an internship program. Uh, and, and later on, uh, I, I worked in summer jobs at uh, Credit Lyonnais, which is a French uh, bank, uh, really helped my French. Uh, I was studying French uh, at Pace, so it really helped a lot to, to be working at a French bank. And, um, and then after that, I ended up uh, working at Citibank as an intern, and they actually offered me a full-time position uh, as an analyst. And that got me going into really learning more about, about numbers. Uh, I cannot under under uh, uh, emphasize, guys, it, it, ladies, books, numbers, I know sometimes for some people it's easier and harder, but even for those who it isn't easy, understanding the books, understanding numbers when you become an entrepreneur is gonna be so helpful to you to help you know, not only just to help you know where they're making money, uh, but if you're ever gonna have to go in front of the banks or investors, you should know how to speak at least at some level so that they know that you know what's going on at your company. It isn't just about creating a widget. They want to know that you know what's happening at the company and you're making money. And how are you making that money? And if I invest with you, how are you going to help me make money? And so on and so forth. So again, it goes about 
applying all these things that you're learning. Uh, uh, and in entrepreneurship, I really feel that knowing the foundation of numbers is, is very helpful. At least for me, it's been very helpful. Um, well, I, I was in banking for about 10 years and moved down to South Florida. Uh, and uh, in, I learned a lot at this smaller bank, much smaller bank. Uh, but after I got my master's degree, uh, I basically was starting asking myself, is this really what I wanted to do? Do I really want to crank out reports to the middle of the night uh, and, you know, and see all the marketing people go home at around six, seven o'clock and they're all smiling and I'm just cranking out reports and reports. Um, and I said, no, I want to try something different. And, 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 and the inspiration actually came from within my family. Uh, my father uh, was a very charismatic man. And I started really realizing that when he walked into a room, everybody smiled. So I started learning, watching my father and seeing what he did. He had a small business. I decided to take some time off and help him with this business. And it taught me a very important thing. First of all, I learned the respect. I used to be in this corporate world. The thousands of people, uh, businesses that you walk by every day, someone wakes up every morning, goes to that little store, raises the iron gate, turns on the lights, and is there to sell. And I'm sure some of you may have parents who have worked themselves at a, a starting a business, something that nondescript, but those people represent 80% of the population. It's a 20-80 rule, but those 80% taught me a lot. They believed in me when I went and knocked on the door and asked them, would you like to buy what I'm selling? And building that relationship, understanding the human side, not just the corporate number crunching was a big, big, big step for me. So social relationships to me uh, are extremely important. And, and, and it's funny, I, I feel that today, I mean, Obviously, I'm older than, than many of you. Uh, I feel that some of that has been lost. I mean, that, that was one of the questions that was posed to me by uh, Ileana that we should talk about. And I really feel that social relationship, presentation skills, um, the ability to pitch ideas are extremely important. And, and that's something that I look for when I'm looking to hire someone. It's not how good you are. You could be the smartest person in the world, but if you're not going to get along with the team, if you're not going to be able to understand that we all work, we all have ideas, and we have to be able to share them and, and get along, it's going to be hard for you to fit into, the, into a company. So I really, really emphasize, take those debate classes, take those speaking classes. Um, they're going to help you. They're really going to give you that confidence to, to, to sort out your ideas, how to present them, and get someone to buy them. Because in life, you're constantly pitching yourself, you know, whether it's to get, uh, to get uh, someone to go on a date with you, uh, to get someone to rent you that apartment building, to get someone to, to give you that car off for $1,000 that you really could do more. Of stuff. It's all about pitching. So uh, definitely, I, I really strongly recommend. I, I took two of those classes, in fact, two of those speaking classes uh, while at Pace. So as I said, I, I really felt that finance uh, had kind of uh, maxed out for me. And, and I started looking around for new opportunities. Um, and it was obviously a hard shift, you know, at 10 years past, you know, many people say, can you make a change 10 years after being in a career? And let me tell you, you can't. It's not easy, though, because your resume has to be modified. You have to take your resume. Uh, I, I had it structured toward a finance uh, 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 career, and I had to work with people to how to change it into more of a demonstrated how I could uh, effectively lead or how I could effectively provide income and grow the P&L. And these are the, you have to target your resume to the people that you're going after. So it, it, it took some time, you know, and a, and a lot of, I uh, uh, went to a lot of these, uh, I forget how you call them, but uh, you know, the job fairs. Uh, and it was hard. It took a long time to make a switch. So I did a, I did a half switch. I stayed in banking, but I went to the marketing department. Uh, so you might laugh uh, when I started my first job in the marketing department was pitching banking by computer. Yes, that was a big thing back in the day. Uh, so I was uh, uh, charged with turning the uh, Citibank consumer into a banking consumer. Uh, and, and believe me, it was hard. It was hard. Um, but uh, after that, I, I had interviewed at two amazing companies. Uh, one was uh, Pratt & Whitney, which is an engine manufacturer for jets. Um, they flew me up to uh, Connecticut, it's a great experience. Uh, it, was, it was amazing, it was a global opportunity to be in the leadership development uh, management program. And the other one was the Walt Disney Company. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it both were great opportunities. Uh, and it just happened to be that uh, 
um, Disney called me back and, uh, and, um, and, and I interviewed one of the longest interviews of, of, of my career. It probably took eight hours. I met with about 10 people. Uh, yeah, here's an interesting thing I'd even thought about. Um, when I went to interview, I did not wear the typical blue suit. I said, everybody here is going to be wearing a blue suit. You need to stand out in an interview, right? Aside from just being yourself, to stand out. So I went out and got myself a, a olive, a suit with a burgundy tie, great shoes. And guess what? After I got the job or doing the interview, somebody told me, great suit, nice tie. It worked. Uh, um, and, and you know, you, you're, a, you're a pebble in a sand, uh, of sand in a beach. So I'm always looking for ways to stand out, especially, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, when I was growing up and I went to Pace, I used to go by Rick. And my father, as I got older, he kept saying, use your name. And you know what? When I went on my own, I went with Ricardo. And uh, I've heard all variations of Ricardo from the British Ricardo and the Spanish Ricardo, you know, and the, the, the Indian Ricardo. It's all there, the Chinese. But people remember Ricardo, you know? And, and again, it's another way of embedding yourself in someone's head that this person is different. Uh, I need to pay attention to this person. And, and as you go out into the world and looking to establish yourself, uh, the competition is fierce. I and mean, you, you, you know that uh, you're competing for grades right now. Well, it's only gonna get harder as you go out there to the business world uh, as people are competing for wages and business. Uh, so I can honestly tell you, even with the humor, it is important to stand out and find a way to, to, to raise your flag amongst the thousands of people and say, here I am, you know? So um, after working at Disney for, for many years, uh, actually I, I created a business inside of Disney uh, and, and that business was what Snap Global Solutions became. They actually decided to shut it down four years later. Um, and I had the opportunity to take a line job at Disney. Uh, in fact, one of the best uh, advice I got from somebody was at Disney. I was interviewing in California for a position and uh, the director met me. And after listening to my interests and what he said, you know, I could hire you, but he said, I'm not going to hire you because you're going to be bored in six months. You're an entrepreneur. Go out and do it. Uh, so uh, meeting people that give you candid advice, candid feedback is extremely important. Uh, that person, I, I, I unfortunately, I, I, I forgot his name and he moved on, but I would have thanked him uh, after all these years. And my father, too. My father actually looked at me and he said, son, you can always get a job. Give it a try. So here we are 23 years later, uh, and Snap Global Solutions is now one of uh, the Walt Disney Company's uh, primary suppliers across the world in developing toys. Uh, uh, along with that, the Mattel Company relies on us, Hasbro. Uh, a lot of other toy companies uh, come to us and, and there isn't anything that we can te teach them about toys, but there's obviously something that we have a value add that we have established that they say, you know what, when we are short on resources or short on time or we need creativity, they come to Snap. And that was one of the reasons why I also named the company Snap because it was supposed to be top of mind. Ooh, who do I call? Snap. So. Again, positioning ourselves as a solution was extremely important to these people because as you go out there, um, people have deadlines, people have budgets, people face overwhelming loads of work. And if you can be a lifeline, a solution that manages to integrate yourself into the day-to-day the -day, that they can turn over a project to you, and know that you're going to fully understand the compliance issues or the deadlines or the requirements, and you deliver to them this, well, they're going to trust you with the next project and the next project and the next project. And it's never a given. Let me tell you, just because you in once, you still have to keep working at it, just like any relationship, any personal relationship. I've been married for 23 years, and it's a constant battle, you know? Uh, because she's beautiful for us that, so I have to you know, keep her interested, of course. But, uh, but you know, it's through humor, it's through uh, uh, many other things that I keep that relationship going, and I keep my clients' relationships going. Um, you know, interesting point right now with the, with, with the pandemic, uh, I haven't been able to see my clients in over two years, and I'm a person who uh, travels 150,000 miles a year. 
Uh, and I travel to Asia four times a year. I, I, I've been to uh, probably many more places in China that, that many people that I know uh, who are Chinese, my friends have been like, my God, you've been to Fujian, Hubei. Uh, I can go on and on and on places uh, that are amazing. And I, and I really encourage you, all of you to travel because that's the most, one of the most things that's amazing about my job, about my life, about traveling. Traveling has been the eye opener uh, because doing business in London and doing business in Hong Kong and doing business in Buenos Aires are completely different. They're all completely different. Uh, and and it's, in fact, that's exciting because as you travel, you can sort of kind of find that common denominator amongst people. Uh, and sort of as you're thinking strategically and developing product lines, what are the things that people like? What are they drawn to? And you know th there could be a product that's made. Uh, uh, you know this is one of the things that I tell my team: don't be American, don't be so American. Just because it's made in America doesn't mean it's going to work in Latin America or it's going to work in Asia. There are nuances in in product development. So I'm way off my here script, and I'm sorry, uh, but uh, like I said, uh, I, I, I get so excited. Here's another thing I have to say: be passionate. That's one thing I want you to walk away from. Be passionate about what you do. I go to work and I'm working here from home now for two years. Uh, I, I, I am as passionate about what I am doing now as I was 23 years ago because I feel fortunate, I feel blessed, but I'm also challenged mentally. I'm challenged to be better for my employees. Uh, you know, working for a smaller company, you have to motivate employees to stay with you. I'm very fortunate that uh, a, a lot of my colleagues uh, had gave up positions. And one of my best friends was a senior vice president at a bank. Others have worked at toy companies and they've come. But why? But because I've created an environment where they feel they can take their skills and they can uh, not lose out. You know, they're still challenged. They're still effective. But guess what? We're flexible. You know, we give that flexibility. Uh, you've got to take your child to, to, to the doctor. No problem. Why? Because I know that creative person is probably going to stay up till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night working because that's the way they work. They all work on different hours. Uh, and it, it, that rewarding of people for their um, skills and recognizing that they are mature professionals, I think is one of the uh, things here at SNAP that we do the best and motivating and challenging them to get better uh, every year? What can we do to help you grow? I mean, that was just a, a question that somebody had for me. You know, it, it's what is the things that, you know, I've progressed in, in my career. Um, it, it's, it, you go from doing all, writing the emails, putting the boxes together, doing this, and just, to sort of becoming this, uh, you're, you, you kind of move up, you lose a little bit of the day-to-day, -day, I guess, of what's going on in this project. I didn't even know we were doing this project until one month in, you know? I mean, that, that, that's how many projects that we're doing. We're developing 400 products every quarter for our customers. Um, but my job is, uh, and I learned this when I was going to school, was like uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, they talked about managing my walking around and visiting the cubicles and everyone listening to them and learn what they needed. And that's what I do. I'm the chief rah-rah officer. I'm here to, 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 to listen to them, uh, uh, to, to see what I can do to help their jobs uh, become more efficient, more effective, to be motivated. Um, every year when we do our budgeting, these are, these are the things that I did take from my professional. We do budgets. Uh, and I basically uh, lay out for my company the strategic goals that I want us to accomplish. And I meet with each of my directors and I tell them, I want to achieve X. What do I need to give you to help me achieve that? And that creative person has one perspective, my chief operating officer, my managing director in Asia and so on and so forth. They all understand the goals and they feed back to me how they can help grow the business. Um, my gosh, I am so far off. I had this presentation skill. So maybe I should take a break right now because I've given you so much. Uh, and honestly, what I told Ileana, I didn't want this to be a one-way thing. You guys already have there from your teachers. They talk to you. I want you to talk back to me. Is there anything I can help you become motivated to take that step to become an entrepreneur? Uh, because believe me, I've talked to a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs. One of my best friends, uh, 
ah, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I said, I told him one day, I told him, just give up. He's too comfortable getting his check every month. And I said, you're, you're, you you got to be like those movies. Uh, what, what was the guy with the, uh, the hat and the whip? Uh, uh, you know who I'm talking about. Indiana Jones. Right? Indiana Jones. There's a point where he crosses. He has to take a step and there's an invisible bridge. That's kind of what entrepreneurship is. Um, you, you, you just have to believe and take that chance. And there's no guarantee. Honestly, I can, and anything I want you to tell you, there is no guarantee, but there's no guarantee you're in life, right? Uh, as long as you do the research. I'm, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll throw these things in that I do have in front of me. Some things that help for entrepreneurship is do the research. Uh, we call it the white paper. What, what is that white space that you've identified as an opportunity? And who are the market leaders or competitors in that white space? That's important to do research because a lot of people have ideas and stuff, but they haven't done the research. So whether it's a service or a product, what is the white space? Uh, and why is that important? Because eventually you're going to have to, if you look for financing, you're going to have to explain that to your potential investors or whether it's a bank. They need to know that you know you've identified an opportunity that can be scalable. That's very important too. I mean, I'm sure you guys watch, many of you may have seen Shark Tank and something like that. Uh, I'm not as vicious as, as, as the guy who wears the black suit, but I am, look at them and I go, they ask good questions. A lot of people just come with ideas that haven't been well thought out. Uh, if you understand your competition and you understand the opportunity, people will give you the chance. Um, value it, knowing yourself. Those, I, since my kids were small, I've been telling them two words. What is your value add? And that means knowing what value, what do you bring to the table to the person you're presenting, to your pitching? Because they meet people every day and the purchasing department meets people every day. The marketing department meets people every day. Everyone's got the greatest solution you know, to ideas. If you know yourself and you know what your skills are, your strengths are, what you bring to the table, again, that is a leg up on your competition, or even on an interview. Uh, uh, knowing yourself and what skills you bring and how your skills can help that company grow or how your, your idea, your service is going to help that company go from, uh, you know, from 1 million 10X to another 10 million sales, they're gonna listen. They're gonna stop, do like the dog, pay attention to you. you know, they're gonna stand up and listen to you because you've got something that interests them. So that's why, you know, when I was interviewing for Disney and, and for Pratt and Whitney, I did a lot of research on those companies. So when I sat down and interviewed, I knew about them as I wanted to know about them as much as they wanted to know about me. So, so just like the same thing when you're pitching, know who you're pitching to and be prepared for the curveball questions that may come at you as an entrepreneur. Uh, financing, where to get the money from, you know, honestly, uh, uh, the way things are nowadays, it's even harder. Uh, yeah, you hear a lot of uh, people out there who are, um, you know, private equity and stuff. Private equity doesn't even listen to you unless you've got a $15 million to $100 million proposal. Uh, that's just, just as a matter of fact. And, and I can tell you because I wanted to acquire a company uh, and, and it was solid uh, reasons to do it. But because the company was only a $15 million acquisition, they weren't interested in it. I mean, it, it's scary to think that way. So you financing begins with your own money, say the banks, family. Um, it's gotten a lot harder, but don't lose faith because there are a lot of grants out there. The government is uh, constantly providing programs. If you're a minority, please, please uh, pursue those opportunities. This coming from a gentleman who's never used his Latin background for that, but I do recommend it because I do participate in Hispanic organizations and I do believe they have great uh, 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 people who want to help you. And if anything, networking. Networking really is one of the most important things I can, I can any tell you as an, as an entrepreneur. Go to those lunches. Go to those things. You never know who you're going to meet. Honestly, uh, and be prepared. Bring your business cards. Uh, every moment, you know, they talk about the elevator pitch. I don't know if they tell you that in school, but there is such a thing as, as, as that, you know, one minute elevator pitch. Um, and, and, and finally, you know, uh, I had on my uh, list here, I, had, I talked about client acquisition, it's leadership. Um, being an entrepreneur is, is, is kind of really a lonely place because you're the, uh, you're the top dog. Who do you turn to? You know, who do you talk to? So again, surrounding yourself with, with people who will give you candid feedback or being open with your employees when you have them. 
I think is one of the most important things. I always tell people uh, being able to say I'm sorry shows how strong you are, uh, uh, that you can accept feedback. Uh, in fact, I'm constantly apologizing to my employees if I make something a mistake or whatever. Uh, and, and they appreciate that I, am, I can take their ideas. And sometimes I say no outright. And the next day I'll come back, you know, I was too quick to say no. I thought about it, let's work on it and da da da. And, and, and it, it, believe me, I have passionate people. And I think I love that the most. It, when you hire someone who is going to go to the fences and fight you uh, for their idea, I would listen to that person because that person remains interested in your company. I'd rather have someone like that than someone says, ah, okay, whatever. The passionate person is going to fight for their ideas. So you should listen and, 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 and great ideas come from everywhere. Um, how do I grow as a professional? I'm constantly uh, peer peer review. Uh, I do have my people that I go and I talk to as, as I measure, but I'm also reading. I read books. Um, for example, uh, I, uh, I'm reading about uh, people who I say, I want to be like them. I read uh, Michael Eisner's book. It, uh, it was a called Work in Progress. Uh, Chris Matthews has a great book called Hardball and it has to do about the psychology of people. A uh, long time ago, I read about uh, Jack Welch. I don't know if you heard about Jack Welch, but General Electric. Um, and, and just recently, I read a book called The Biggest Bluff. It was a psychologist who learned to become one of the best uh, poker players in the world. But through psychology, she real, it's, a, it's a way of management how you shouldn't uh, uh, ignore information as it's presented to you. And in poker, it's a great book to say how people come in with their filters and they don't look at new situations. They think that the last situation is going to be the same as the new situation. So it's a great book about business and about opening your eyes and paying attention to the environment. Um, television. You know, I'm, 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 uh, I wake up at six in the morning and I'm, and I'm watching the news, uh, whether it comes from uh, overseas or whether it comes from the financial, uh, social media. All of these things uh, have impacts on uh, decisions. It is a foreign exchange, the, the Roman B, the Chinese Roman B versus the US. How is the dollar doing? I'm gonna have to pay more. Uh, what is, uh, how is the economics doing? Is Disney uh, going to benefit from travelers increasing? Because you know, during the pandemic, when they opened up, we were flooded with demand. You know? So all of these things, little news, you know, we had to prepare for these things. Uh, advising your clients, hey, you know, it's uh, people are going to come to the parks. Um, COVID, wow, COVID hasn't been in any of my books that I learned, studied in 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 in, in uh, Pace or at FIU. And there is no manual, guys. And I'll tell you one thing from entrepreneurship: there isn't a book that covers every single topic that you're going to go to. At some point, it's uh, experience. Uh, it's truthful to yourself, go with your gut. At the end of the day, I always tell people, my decision, I listen to your advice, the decision is mine because I have to suffer the consequences, the good and the bad. So I'd rather it be my decision, but be humble. Listen to the people that you're with. Um, you pay them for a reason. You don't pay them to say yes. I pay my people to say no. I tell them, I pay them to say no. And believe me, they tell me no a lot. And you know what? I think it pays off a lot for me. I'm still here, 23 years, hopefully some more. And with that, I am going to take a break and, and let you talk, I hope. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is a great overview of your career and your excitement about what you do. It's really nice to see this. Uh, we rarely get to see someone as excited about what they do as you are. So thank you. With that, we'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. You can raise your hand with... Uh, a chat function, it was a, raising your hand or you can put it in the chat and Ileana will grab it out and ask the question. Please feel free to do that and take advantage of this very successful alumnus. I, I think I have a question to start off and it, it might be slightly problematic. Which is your favorite toy that you have developed thus far? Do you have any favorites? Well, I do have favorites. I have to, I have to say one of my favorites, it was Monsters Inc. product because my daughter, uh, was born uh, uh, just before Monsters Inc. Right, that was back in 2000, and I that that changed my my my, my business. I worked for Hasbro, and I was working on this project. You know, you guys know uh, Sully and, and Wazowski, right? Well, you know, I I started on this project with Hasbro, 
And, and, and the funny thing was I decorated my daughter as Boo. So we were walking down in Halloween. The movie hadn't come out yet. So people were kind of looking at her like, who is this girl and what is her costume? You know, because we had to decorate it with the toys. Uh, and, you know, a month later, boom, monsters took off. So I guess that's one of my favorites. Um, and anything Lucas Star Wars, we've been very fortunate. Uh, if you guys had I once gone to uh, Star Wars land in, in, in Disney World or Disneyland, but uh, the company picked us, um, no bid. They came to us and every toy that you see in Star Wars land and Galaxy's Edge is designed by us. Uh, uh, electronics, or basic plush and, and it was top secret. Oh, oh, hush, hush, you know, it's, I mean, these, it's really, it's like you have to sign this NDA. Lucas, you know, uh, seeing this, uh, the CEO of Disney wasn't, was everyone's involved. And I was just like, you know, I, I, I felt like Ronnie Day Dangerfield, you know, when he's like uh, getting, uh, getting nervous there, but we, we managed to pull off that project um, and it's been a great success for us. And so, so, so yeah, those are two of my favorites. Thank you. Uh, Sophia. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the students who maybe are watching, maybe they're aspiring entrepreneurs, but it sounds like on that journey, you know, there might be a lot of mistakes and you learn from those mistakes, but what, are your words of advice to these students to encourage them to keep going because it, I'm sure it can be discouraging at times. So what do you have to say to them to kind of motivate them to keep going? That's a great question. In fact, just recently I read something, it was, a, it was a, sort of these phrases, you can't learn unless you fall down how to get up and walk again, right? So you're all nodding your heads. And, and the reality is, since you know it, believe it. I have to tell you, believe it. And there are going to be some that, that I remember once, uh, it was 2008, remember the uh, financial economic crisis and whatnot? I use humor, as you can tell, because you know it, it just comes to a point where you just have to sort of realize that you've done everything you can do. And, and you, need, you also need that mental health. You, you've got to let it go. And the things are going to work out one way or the other, right? And if you believe in yourself, yeah, maybe some idea is a disaster, but maybe the next one isn't. And maybe this career is a disaster, but maybe the next career, I have failed, but I've also learned through my failures, uh, uh, honestly. Um, and I remember my CEO walking in, I said, well, I'm just gonna go into the, you know, well, maybe because this is being taped, I won't say that. But anyway, that was, I used humor to get through that moment. And guess what? Uh, I learned what I needed to do. I cut back uh, uh, and reorganized and 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 we came out stronger we a lot of competitors went away uh and during the pandemic a lot of competitors also fell away and guess what our customers said wow snap is still around that helps that perseverance that spirit and as an entrepreneur let me tell you something you're being watched constantly by your by your colleagues that's another thing so 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 smile i smile a lot i i i i i i i Tell them, you know, you're doing a great job um, when they deserve it. Uh, I'm not one of these, you know, just, you know, giving a prize just because you, you you finished the tournament, you know, kind of thing. They know what I expect of them. That I know what they expect of me. It's a very candid relationship. So if I ever do something wrong, uh, if I fail in what I'm supposed to be doing as a CEO, they call me out. They let me know, hey, you know, I think you should do this next time. And you know what? I welcome that. So. Uh, yeah, there'll be opportunities that you fail and you know what, just pick yourself up and know that start singing Annie. I actually have Annie on my playlist. The sun comes out tomorrow and I do play it on those rough days. You know, I do play it on those rough days. There are two questions in the chat, right? Yeah. So the first question, one second. Uh, what would be your advice for people who would like to take on managing and leadership positions is an MBA essential and how did it help you? Great question. Uh, I waited several years before I got my MBA. Uh, I believe that life experience is very important. Um, and school is one setting and the, the workforce is another setting. When I got my MBA, I went back because I had practical experience. I appreciated my studies and MBA more so than I did in my bachelor's degree because I could see association. I could be like, if it was 
if we were doing case studies or whatever, I would be like, oh, okay, yeah, how did we deal with something like that? Or how will I deal with something if it comes to me? There was practical, there was an application. Uh, there was a basis to be able to take my experiences and apply it to my master's degree. So it, it, I do believe a master's degree helps. I believe the timing of whatever you do is very important. You know, there, there, is a, there is a time to, to do something. There's not a time to do something. Go out there, get the experience, go back for your master's degree, in my opinion. Um, the next question, in your experience, what is slash was the most effective way to market yourself and get the word out about your services to potential customers? Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm unique. I do things uh, very, very differently. Um, I, I, first of all, um, I'm very much a believer in meeting people in person. I, I think that is extremely important. Uh, uh, please, emails, I, I tell my team constantly, get to know your customers, get to know the people you're going to deal with. Because when the uh, proverbial SH blank hits the fan and you need help from your customers, if you're just an email, easy to discard. But if you have that relationship, you have that personal relationship, it's a leg up. So what do I do to stand out? Again, you've heard me talking about it, doing my research about the company, identifying their needs, positioning myself in a place why I should really help. Most recently, Mattel. Mattel is a multi-billion dollar company. What am I going to teach them about toys? Seriously, what am I going to teach them about toys? But I had the gumption to walk in to Mattel in, uh, out in California, El Segundo, uh, and meet uh, a senior vice president who uh, stared me down like uh, I was a first grader. And within a half hour, we were talking and exchanging business relationship. I didn't, uh, one thing I learned my first job, don't try to BS someone if you don't know the answer. Be honest, tell them, I don't have that answer for you and I'll come back and I'll get it for you. I learned that lesson very quickly at Citibank. And I learned to never do it again. People will respect you if you say, I don't have that answer. So when I talk to my clients or when my prospective clients or my current clients, I'm very candid. I'm very candid with them. If, if, if a product is not doing well, uh, even if it's a Disney product and I'm talking to Paris, when I'm meeting them in Paris and, they're, and I'm, I'll be like, don't do it. And you know what? They respect me for that. And they come back and they call me and they say, Ricardo, what do you think of this and this and this? When you have that kind of a relationship with a client, uh, you have a leg up again because they have the same challenges you do. So they're looking for someone who understands their needs, knows you're not going to feed them some line just to sell, you know, one and done. They, you want a relationship. So doing the research, being candid, I think the, one of the most important things, being friendly, smile. Smile. I learned that from the movie La Femme Nikita, I think. And the lady teaches her, when you walk into a room, smile. And it uh, doesn't matter if she's a killer, but still, she's a smile. Everybody ignores her and she does her job. So uh, smiling really gets, uh, they say it a lot. When you smile at someone, they smile back at you. And, and I think that is another way of breaking down a barrier. Remember, you're trying to break down barriers when you're walking in to a new meeting, okay? You're trying to establish yourself a relationship. Uh, nobody likes grumpy bugs. I always used to play the grumpy bug video for my kids, you know, I used to make fun of them when they were grumpy. So uh, smile, smile more. Yojin? I was uh, fascinating, uh, fascinated, fascinating to hear <laughs> your presentation. I'm so glad to meet you. I'm an accounting professor at Pace. And I was so happy when you mentioned like, p &L and books, <laughs> those terms, because I teach them in the class. My question today is, how do you encourage um, team, <laughs> teamwork, because I, whenever I give my students group assignments, oh my goodness, <laughs> they're always like this outcry of not being fair, they get free writing problem. I mean, I, I try to accommodate their need as best as I could, but sometimes I feel like helpless, right? Like these students sometimes do not uh, answer any questions, emails, no text, nothing. And then the remaining students refuse to take those students back. And like, I'm sure uh, 
you saw that kind of <laughs> situations in your career and what was your take? How did you resolve that conflict? Well, I'm not going to talk about SNAP because obviously being the boss, you know, I, I created an environment where teamwork is very important, but I created that environment because I really teamwork is important and not one person has a solution. You know, ideas come from multiple sides, uh, different perspectives. I'll talk about when I was first starting, you know, uh, uh, one of the things, or even school. School, you know, I, it's a part of the maturation process, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm older, more experienced, so I'm more relaxed, obviously. And as you're younger, yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of a challenge uh, to be in a group environment. Uh, but uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, what I've seen the most effective for me is not starting a project. Oh, let's talk about project. I, I would say get to know the people around you. Okay, they're all human. They're all people. They're all there for the same reason you are to get an education. But everybody has different ticks, you know, different buttons that get them going, right? If you kind of get to know everyone, you know, you may have some very much in common with some person. Okay, maybe less in common with some. Maybe they're more shy. The point is, if you just approach this from just, oh, we got to get this task done, you may not get the most motivated, you know, response. But if you humanize it, if you really humanize it, at least I feel you'll get more people into the group. You may not get everybody. There are always outliers and everything. Um, and some people are just not interested or whatnot. You can't do that. But at least if, if you can get the majority of people involved and even that person, don't give up on the outlier because you know they may have their own reasons. I, I always tell my kids, you know, someone may be having a bad day. Uh, uh, just let it go, you know, let it go. But maybe the next time they're around, you bring them in. You know, not, it, it, things take time. Good things take time, right? So that, that would be my motivation. First, get to know each other as a group, introduce yourselves, why you're there, and then uh, see where the common denominator is. And maybe that's a way of starting a good conversation and a good project. I have another question. Uh, as a non-business major person, is it possible to be an entrepreneur? And what skills uh, should I do or have to pivot into that space? into the business space. Well, I mean, absolutely. Uh, 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 there are so many people who have made that crossover uh, simply because they understood that what they had to offer what transcended just a classification of whether I'm a creative arts person or I'm a business person, honestly. Uh, I look at, I have an appreciation for art because my wife was an art dealer. Uh, and tacitly, uh, uh, over time, I began to appreciate it. And behind me, I have art pieces. We collect art now. Now, interesting enough, I collect art. I look at it as the business side. <laughs> we have our battles because she comes in. You know, I don't know if you know who Rauschenberg is, but he's an American masters. And, and we always have these jokes because he liked doing things with chicken feathers and stuff. And I'd be like, where is the art in that? Um, but I, I joke because everyone has different sides of the brain. We activate with the right side or left side of the brain. I think a person, the fact that you've asked that question means that you're curious about the non-creative side. You're looking for, how do I take this wealth knowledge that I have in art and monetize it or make some business out of it? Well, we just talked about a team. Maybe you can find someone on the other who is a little bit more heavily leaning towards a logical side that you can share the ideas with and they can help you organize your ideas so that when you present it to someone or when you wanna launch it, uh, it's based on some solid business foundations. I think that would be some of my recommendation. Same thing like someone who's a business uh, major, why not approach a creative person? Uh, because you know we're not all Henry Ford. You know, Henry Ford says, you know, I'll, I'll give them any color they want as long as it's, you guys know business majors, no? Black, black, that's all he said. I'll give you any color as long as it's black. So, you know, in, nowadays you guys are fortunate that your school allows you to cross over. I, I strongly recommend if you've been just going down that business road and I wish I would have done it, I would have done this for myself, take some creative classes, take some non-business courses, something that challenges you to, to think differently. It, 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 the world is a lot brighter and sharper when 
you, you know, you, you see something differently. That's why I love artists because they paint something and I'm trying to understand how did they look, you know, look at Picasso, look at Picasso and how he distorted people. How did he take something and make it so amazing that I'm here staring at him wondering what did he see in that pot that, that he, he took some water pots and turned them into fish out of just a pot. And, and if you see the images of Picasso working at one of these ateliers in, 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 in Italy or Spain, the people who made pots all their lives, uh, they were stunned that he could take something they've been working all their life and turn it into a work of art. That's what I mean. And learning comes from all, all the facets of life. Phil, any questions? I see you there. You, um, yeah, I, I, you, you, anything I can help you with? Primrose, anything? Any questions you have? Uh, Ricardo, I have another question, um, and it may be slightly sensitive. I'm not sure. It's regarding ESG. Um, are, you, are you aware of what it is? <laughs> yeah, the environmental, uh, right? It's yes, not... environment, social, and governance initiatives. Yeah. So there is a big focus on that in many businesses these days. Um, and a lot of them talk about sustainability. So I was wondering what your take on this is um, and what you or SNAP um, does in regards to ESG and sustainability. Fantastic question, fantastic question. Actually, we're, we're leading in uh, environmental sustainable products. We have been quietly working with the Walt Disney Company for two years now, identifying and sourcing rely, uh, sustainable fabrics. Uh, and uh, I haven't announced it because we, we were waiting for Disney, but um, our products are made of polyester uh, materials. So uh, uh, four years ago, the pandemic, I was in Germany at the show and I was already doing my research identifying Europe is obviously way ahead of us when it comes to sustainability. Uh, and, and environmentally friendly uh, uh, policies. Um, so again, being in the toy industry, as I said earlier, quite seriously, we are one of the most heavily regulated uh, industries. So while it's a lot of fun, um, we get tested. If, if there's a new test to be made, someone wakes up in the middle of the night, it's, a, it's probably one of those guys at the toy industry and they're looking for new ideas and new things. Um, so when sustainability became a topic, the toy industry did start looking for ways to become a participant in that. And uh, our products now, our fibers that make up this product, the stuffing are all recycled uh, materials uh, from plastic bottles and, and other like. Uh, the outside fabrics uh, are slowly and surely becoming more sustainable. It's a slow process, why? Because unfortunately it takes time, um, but we are on our way and Snap is a leader in that. Uh, already 100% of our products are stuffed with uh, recyclable, sustainable fibers and the outside materials. Uh, we're beginning to ship uh, this upcoming quarter to the Walt Disney Company. You will start seeing their products transitioning to sustainable materials. And 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 once I started that, I began uh, prophesizing that to my other customers, saying, "Hey, are do you have a policy? Are you planning to do this?" Uh, so so yeah, I, I take good ideas and try to spread them as much as I can. That's really wonderful to hear. And I think um, I have a final question. I don't know if anyone wants to ask before I go. Nope. Okay. So my final question, um, are there any projects that you can remember being especially hard or complicated? Uh, and how did you overcome that? I know a lot of us in our day-to-day -day lives, we were constantly overcoming certain struggles. But when it comes to work, it can oftentimes get really frustrating. And sometimes we start to doubt ourselves. So is there something that you found um, that you were able to overcome? Absolutely. Uh, and it isn't projects. It's, it's failures. It's failures. Remember that if I make a wrong decision, it could be that financially the company has to, you know, can't pay its bills or whatever. So, yeah, I've had uh, strategic decisions where I've wanted to, uh, uh, distribute uh, or, 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 or launch a product line, whatever. And uh, like Harry Truman said, at the end of the day, the buck stops here, right? Uh, my, my decisions have impacts uh, on, on the company. So uh, they are, they are very gut wrenching when you, when you make decisions and you, th you see things are going wrong. Um, it's, it's a great, what I'm about to say is it's, it's in that book. 
why do people keep, you know, like when they're betting or when they're doing something, why do they keep putting money down? Why do they keep putting money down? The information in front of you is telling you it's not working. Why do you go with your gut feeling? You think it's going to keep going. You know, when you're running a company, you have to be humble and realize, hey, sometimes the decisions you make were wrong. Uh, so that's when you take all your skill sets and your colleagues and you say, what's our exit strategy? How do we get out of this? How do we realign ourselves into a more profitable uh, 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 path? Uh, I've had to do that. Uh, uh, and again, it's, it's humbling, but it, I think humble, humbleness is great in being a leader. Uh, we don't have all the answers. It, just because you become the boss of your company doesn't make you infallible. It, it, it just makes you responsible uh, to all those people who report to you. Remember, they're just as important as, as, as I'll say it again, as you are. Uh, they are all in on your idea. They're there to support you. Um, they're the ones who uh, uh, are working uh, while your kids and you are taking a vacation. Uh, you know, you've got to reward your colleagues. You've got to reward your employees. You've got to be humble. You've got to keep yourself up to date on information. Um, and you've got to have fun. And, and that is one of the most important things. You know, when, when I go to these toy fairs, I, I'm amazed how people don't smile as much as, as, as I am. I'm walking around and I'm, I'm happy as a, as a pig in, in mud because you know what? I, I get to do what I love. I get to work with people that I like and it's a living and I get to travel the world. I get to meet great people like you and looking at you, all of you. And, and, and I'm telling you, you know what? It's whatever you do, have a great time doing it. Have fun. And if you're not having fun, think twice. I did it 10 years after being in banking. I stopped, made a right turn, and here I am, having fun. So uh, if anyone ever wants to ask me a question, I think you have information, but send me an email. I'm more than happy to help. I think uh, the, the best I can do in my life is try to pass along a little bit of my wisdom. Uh, and my kids will be thankful because they get it. They get it from me all the time, every day. You know, they don't want to hear it anymore, but, uh, but I'm happy to help. I think you guys are the future uh, and your perspectives are, are going to be different than mine. Uh, but uh, remember us old dogs, you know, we, we have a little bit of experience, you know, you can always come to us and we can tell you how it was back in the day. You know, if that helps, we're here to help. Thank you very much, Mr. Venegas. This is a wonderful Dean's Roundtable. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time. We have a small token of appreciation to you. Unfortunately, I can't hand it to you over the Zoom call. So please look for it to arrive in your home in Florida in a few days. Uh, I look forward to getting to know you better. Thank you for um, sharing your story with us very much. Thank you for taking time to be here with My us. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. And I hope what I said was of interest to you. Thank you very much. Very much so. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Have right. a great day. Have a great day, guys. You.